Today, a clever journalist exposed just how easy it is to manipulate people on social media. Good morning. Good Tuesday morning to you. I'm Shane Satterfield from Sifted, and this is Good Morning Gaming for February 15th, 2022. It comes bright and early every weekday to our patrons who pledge at patreon.com slash sifted, and it's delayed a couple days for everyone else. If you like our content, we also have a separate podcast feed for our flagship show, Game Face, that you can find by searching your favorite podcast service. You'll find the podcast versions of the rest of our content in the same feed you found this. So today, what I would argue is one of the most brilliant pieces of gaming journalism for the last maybe even decade was shared by John Cartwright from Good Vibes Games. He recently conducted a social media experiment where he tried to build a leak profile on Twitter using nothing but lies and subterfuge. And it worked. Here's his plan. Again, absolutely brilliant. Leading up to the latest Nintendo Direct, he started a brand new Twitter account. And he just started tweeting. But the catch is, his account was set to private. So he just wrote hundreds and hundreds of tweets, guessing what might happen in the Nintendo Direct. And lo and behold... He ended up being right on a few. So what he did was after the direct ended, he went through his tweets, deleted the tweets that were incorrect, kept the few that he got right, and then turned the account public. And then started pushing to the tweets, showing people, hey, I had this right five days ago. I had this one right eight days ago. I had this one right a week ago. And people fell for it. It, <laughs> it created a 20-page thread on Game Facts, there was a post on Reset Era, there was a post on Reddit, a host of other sites were pushing to his account, including, according to him, a legitimate news outlet that he refused to name. I'm sure you can dig that up if you want to look. We didn't feel it was necessary. He said to perpetuate the account once it had become noticed. All he had to do was tell people what they wanted to hear. So he would just say things like, oh, GoldenEye is coming to Switch. Something that's probably likely had already been floating around already. Things that people could go and Google and they'd find an article or two and be like, oh, okay, maybe this guy is legit. Another tactic that he used was just tweeting things that were most likely to happen. Things that had already been rumored. Things that were just like no-brainers. And again, while they weren't groundbreaking, it helped solidify his credibility with these people who were now stalking his Twitter account. In the matter of seven hours, he had well over a thousand followers. People were pointing to his account from all different directions of the internet. And at that point, he started making bolder predictions, like games that fans are dreaming of, saying that they're in development already. And because people had already been reeled in by his private tweets that he then turned public, they started believing this stuff. And so his plan all along was to run this account for just one day, just to see how many followers he could get, what kind of pin action he could get on social media and on message boards. And it spiraled out of control so quickly that he ended it in just seven hours because websites had started reporting on this entirely fake Twitter account. So as I said, he started making announcements of games that fans were dreaming of. And then the kicker is, if he wanted to continue this Twitter account beyond the one day or beyond the seven hours it ended up lasting, he had cover. So he said, such and such game is, is coming to Switch. A fan's dream game. But he has two to three years before anyone's ever going to hold him to account. So think about that. Two or three years later, someone tweets at him, hey, what's up with this game you predicted? And then all he has to say is, oh, it was canceled. It had development trouble. It, <laughs> the whole thing is brilliant. Again, kudos to John Cartwright. This is, I love it. I know some people may be sitting there right now saying, is it wrong for deceiving people? And generally, I think it's a terrible idea to deceive people. So he is wrong 
But sometimes you have to do things for the greater good. And as someone who works on a gaming news curation website, who has to sift through all of this crap to try to figure out who's reliable and who isn't, I think it's a lesson that people needed to learn. And sometimes you have to learn the big lessons the hardest. And he, (laughs) to his credit, a lot of the people that he fooled were not angry with him at all. They actually were praising the brilliance of what he did. And they said in a lot of their tweets, I'm going to reevaluate how I've been consuming social media. So I feel like this ideal goes far beyond gaming. There are so many accounts out there that focus on one topic. It could be sports, it could be politics, it could be whatever. They're all doing the same thing. (laughs) So while we try to protect you here on Sifted by vetting rumors as best we can, it's really ultimately just up to you. So be careful out there. And I do recommend going and watching the full video. We have it curated on Sifted, or you could go straight to it on YouTube. Again, it was John Cartwright from Good Vibes Games. Good work. You need to support it. So turn off your ad blocker while you watch <laughs> while you watch the video to make sure that he gets rewarded for the great work that he's done. Now for a couple more stories from the top of your sifts. Lots of big games being reviewed today, but none are bigger than Horizon Forbidden West, the PlayStation exclusive, the highly anticipated sequel to Horizon Zero Dawn. And so far the reviews, while good, haven't been stellar. I have to admit, I'm pretty surprised about this. Its Metacritic is sitting at 89 right now. And while there are, I don't know, a handful of perfect 10s or 100s, whatever you want to call it, there are just as many that have completely bombed the game. (laughs) I wouldn't say bombed, but there are some reviews at like a 6. There's like a 6.5. There's a couple outlets that really take it to task. And this comes as a complete shock to me. This is another example of a game that doesn't seem like it's completely finished. And I never would have expected that out of this game at all. Most of the complaints about it are bugs. There are issues with the facial animation, like Aloy's eyeballs sometimes just freak out in the middle of conversations. Um, There's textures that disappear and appear. There's crash bugs. I, I mean, I remember the first game. It wasn't perfect, but it wasn't that bad. So it does appear that this game, for whatever reason, has been rushed out to get out within the quarter. Now, to be fair, like I said, there are plenty of reviews that have given it perfect 10s or 100s. Most of the big outlets are right around a 9, right around the Metacritic. It's like, an eight, again, it's an 8.9, and the bigger outlets tend to be around a 9. I think GameSpot gave it an 8. That's surprising. And again, it was one of the outlets that really complained about bugs. And at the same time, it had the footage to back up its assertions. But, man, kind of surprising, to be honest. I'll say this, watching... A couple of the video reviews, the game is just a stunner. You know, there's always concerns that when you have a game that straddles generations like this one, because you can buy it for PS4 or PS5, that it might hold the PS5 version back. But man, if that's held back, holy moly, it is a stunner. So the game comes out on Friday. Early reviews are out there. They're mostly glowing, uh, but more negatives than I really thought that there would be. Reviews are also out for the Cuphead TV show coming to Netflix on February 18th. Very simple title. It's just called The Cuphead Show. (laughs) And the reviews are also mixed on this a bit, but more so even than Horizon Forbidden West. One outlet says that it's like Ren and Stimpy, which, hey, hey, (laughs) that's definitely a dog whistle for me. And they said that it's like Ren and Stimpy and that It's a goofy show that kids can sit and laugh at, and there's nothing so offensive about it that you would feel uncomfortable having your kids watch it. But they also said that there's adult innuendo in the show, so the parents can sit and watch the show and also get a couple chuckles while their kids are entertained. It's hard to do that. Thinking back through pop culture, it's hard to think of too many products that manage to straddle that line. Um, I would argue Rare's 3D platformers, like Banjo, Kazooie, and Tooie, they were kind of like that. Uh, they had some adult innuendo hidden in some of the uh, the scripts for those games. It just would have totally went over the kid's head. So anyway, one review says that that's what the Cuphead show is like. And then another one says that it's just simply not funny. And because it, kids can watch it, 
It feels like they've sacrificed the aesthetics of the video game. They also complained that they didn't feel like it represented itself as a property based on games all that well. So the good news is it's on Netflix and it launches on the 18th. So if you already are a subscriber, it's no skin off your butt to give it a watch. I know I'll be checking it out. Today, Capcom launched a countdown clock counting down to February 21st. The Japanese publisher isn't giving away any hints, although the font that's being used in the actual clock does look like the same font that was used for Resident Evil Village. I don't know what could be a big enough deal in Resident Evil Village that it would warrant a countdown clock. It just, I don't know, it doesn't add up to me. It also coincides, the date, with the wrap-up of the Capcom Pro Tour. So, could it be the next Street Fighter? That would be pretty awesome. But I'll be honest, the aesthetics of the countdown clock don't really look like it would be something related to Street Fighter or really anything cheery at all. I guess another option would be the Resident Evil 4 remake, which has really been making the rounds on the rumor sites and message boards and social media. That to me maybe seems most likely, but either way, we'll find out in six days. Reviews for The King of Fighters 15 are also rolling in, although certainly at a much slower rate than the reviews for Horizon Forbidden West. Fighting games don't come out all that often, and King of Fighters, one of my favorites from the past, but I feel like it's struggled to really keep up with its contemporaries over the last half decade or so. And reviews for the new game seem to echo that sentiment. Most reviews say that it's just simply too similar to the King of Fighters 14, and that the single player options are lacking. With NetherRealm still making fighting games, that's just not good enough anymore. Outlets have also pointed out that it still has a very strong backbone, that the fighting system is solid, though they also say very challenging. They, I think one outlet compared it to like the Dark Souls of fighting systems. But most outlets also agreed that the netcode has been vastly improved, which has been a big issue with this series in the past. It's also sitting at a respectable 79 on Metacritic, so if you're jonesing for a new fighting game, you could definitely do a lot worse. If you're a big RTS fan struggling to find a new game, Creative Assembly has come to the rescue, again. Total War Warhammer 3 for PC is getting gigantic review scores. Kotaku went so far as to say that it improves on its predecessor in every conceivable way. PC Gamer claims it has the most inventive factions yet. There aren't many dissenters at all. It's sitting at an 87 right now on Metacritic. So if you have a hankering for some turn-based strategy, dive right on in. Nintendo president Shuntaro Furukawa says that his Switch sales to new owners start to wane. The evergreen sales of games like Mario Kart 8, Breath of the Wild, Animal Crossing New Horizons, and Super Mario Odyssey should start to decline too. This is perhaps the first admission from Nintendo that its Switch console is reaching a saturation point. Now it did finish in third place in January. I'm still assuming that that was just because of a lack of supply. They sold everything they had over the holidays. But again, this is the first time that Nintendo's hinted that maybe things are starting to plateau. Oddly enough though, this is actually great news for existing Switch owners because Furukawa also said that Nintendo will increase its focus on new games to combat the loss in revenue. In the console space, this is a very good problem to have and as a player, an even better problem to have. Okay, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll tackle today's boss fight. Welcome to today's boss fight where I tackle random topics that may or may not be related to video games. Today is Valentine's Day, and I know most of you are listening to this on the day after Valentine's Day, but I think it may be more apropos on the day after Valentine's Day than on Valentine's Day. I just want to start by saying that I am very lucky. I have an amazing wife who supports me in pretty much everything I do. I honestly can't say enough good things about her. I am so lucky to have the wife that I have. And honestly, if it wasn't for her patience, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. I would have been forced by a lot of wives to have quit working on Sifted by now. That's just the truth. She's been very patient. 
She believes in me. She believes in my ideas. She sees how hard I work. And she has allowed me to keep doing this. So, again, I am very, very lucky. I have an amazing wife. And I can't complain about my life romantically. But my life hasn't always been that way. I've had Valentine's Days where I didn't have a Valentine. I've had the Lonely Hearts Club things where everyone who doesn't have a Valentine goes to the bar together or shows up at someone's house and watches corny rom-coms. I've done it. I've been there. I think everybody has. And I know how tough it can be. And so I just wanted to speak to the people who were maybe in that situation yesterday and maybe feeling that way today. And what I just want to say is, keep your chin up. I know it's a cliche and people always say, oh, there's someone for everyone. But I'll be honest, I've had friends throughout the years who I knew better than probably anyone else. And knowing them that well, I really thought to myself that they may never find someone. And they did. Almost all of them did. And I'm not here to be your romance consultant, but I am pretty old. And I have been around the block a few times, and I have dated a lot of women. In fact, I've dated four different women for longer than a year, and three of them for two years or longer. So I've been in long-term relationships. I've been with girls that the relationship lasted a week, where we dated for a while, we made the commitment to each other where we weren't going to date other people and then that ended within a week so i've run the gamut of dating and romance and i feel like i have a pretty good handle on what it takes for people to connect i've also been a prolific connector someone who meets two different people and then recognizes that they would be good together. So I have connected so many people in relationships. Some of them have worked out long-term, not all of them, but actually several. And two of them, specifically, ended in marriage. So I've connected at least two people that ended up getting married. And I will say this, both of those couples are still married today. So I feel like I have a little bit of an understanding of how romantic relationships work. And I'm going to give you some tips. I think if you're someone who's maybe struggling to find someone or just maybe struggling to find the right person, I'm going to give you some tips, at least things that I've learned throughout the years. Take these for what they're worth. The first thing I would say is, and this is tough right now with the pandemic still going on, it seems like we're maybe slowly coming out of that and we're able to go do some more things than maybe we have for the last couple of years. But the number one thing I would say is go out. And I know really young kids might be saying, oh, that's not how people meet anymore. People meet on Tinder or whatever dating site people decide to use. I know that. I know that's how a lot of people end up meeting. But I'm telling you, you've got to go out. Because when you go out, you're expressing what you're interested in. And the other people that are wherever you are are doing the same thing. So if you like to go to art galleries or you like art, go to the art gallery You're going to meet other people there who also like art. And if it's something that they're that passionate about, that they will go out to an outing for it, it's important to them. And if you're doing it, it's important to you. It's important to have things like that that you're passionate about that you both share. So go out, no matter where out is, whether it's going to see your favorite band, whether it's going to an art exhibit, whether it's going just to the beach for a walk or going to the park to play frisbee, whatever it is that you like to do, Go do it. To me, that's how you make the connections that are actually going to last, if that's what you're looking for. Second, I would say, is don't write people off right away. They say first impressions are everything, and they are strong. It is really hard to shed a first impression of somebody. A lot of times you need three people telling you that your first impression is wrong before you finally maybe accept it and look at that person in a different way. But really give people a chance. I can't tell you how many, and in my case, women or girls that I've met, that when I first saw them, I wasn't attracted to them. I don't know, physically or whatever, it doesn't matter. I just simply wasn't attracted to them. And then I talked to them. And it's funny how if you meet someone that you really connect with, their appearance starts to change. I'm not kidding. You'll notice things about them that you do find physically attractive that you didn't notice on first look. So give people a chance, number two. Number three, try as hard as you can to really, and I hate to use another cliche, 
care about their personality more than you care about their looks. Like, if you can find someone where you love their personality and their looks, that's great. But that doesn't really happen all that often. So really try to put as much emphasis on their personality and their disposition and their passions, at least as much as you can. Because that is what pays off in the long term. And again, provided you're looking for something long term. I know some of you people just want to hook up and move on. That's totally fine. I'm talking to people who want a relationship. People who were lonely on Valentine's Day yesterday. Personality is what carries the day. When you're dating, you're usually in pretty good shape. You, you try not to let yourself, let yourself go. You try to work out when you can. You try to stay active because you're trying to attract someone. But what tends to happen is both of you have been doing this. You start dating and then you get comfortable and people change. Their looks change. And then you're left with the proposition of, do I like being around this person? And that's why it's so important to make sure that you connect with this person in an intellectual way, an emotional way, an empathetic way. And it's not just about your physical attraction to that person. That is how you have a long lasting relationship that can be extremely rewarding. And then finally, try to adjust what you expect from someone. Do not try to find you in someone else. I can tell you right now, you do not want to be with someone who is exactly like you. It will last for a while. Two of the girls that I dated that made it over a year, one of them over two years, were basically the female versions of me. They liked the same music. They liked going to the same places. They liked the same food. That I, we were basically male and female versions of the same person. And it works at first because you're agreeable to everything. But in the end, it becomes very uninteresting. So I would argue, if you have the choice and the opportunity to choose who you date, try to find someone who's a little bit different than you. And maybe even a lot different. But at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, you still have to have those one or two things that you're both passionate about. Once you have that bedrock, that foundation, the rest of it is superfluous. And if you guys are different, you're going to be playing off of each other and you're going to be teaching each other. So to me, that's how the ideal relationship generally plays out. So there you go. Shane's dating tips on the day after Valentine's Day. If you're feeling a little low today, you didn't have a date yesterday, didn't have a Valentine. Keep your chin up. There's someone out there for you. I know it's a cliche, but most cliches are cliches because they're true. All right. Thanks for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I appreciate every single one of you who listens to GMG. I'm Shane Satterfield, and you can do what the cool kids do and follow me on Twitter at Dinfire and follow Sifted at Sifted Games. While you're at it, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash sifted. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow, but until then, make sure you seize today, because there will never be another. Another.